live. I'll let you know when. Say when. We're live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Eric. Uh, welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, Alex is uh, somewhere else, so I'm the, the uh, backup host. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone if they have anyone that might want to give a presentation. Oh, hold on one second. I've got to do my. Uh... We simply decide a better shoe. You can put on effortlessly. You've never. Yep, I didn't mute my YouTube channel. I just muted it. I just want to remind anyone if they have a suggestion for anyone that might want to give a presentation on the Astro Imaging Channel, you know, please send us a note and let us know. Uh, you can contact them directly, or one of us can. You don't need to be the world's expert to give a presentation. You just have to have an area that you're interested in and sit up there in front of your camera and uh, tell us what you know. I don't want to say it's altogether easy, but it's pretty straightforward and uh, anyone can do it. Okay, getting on. Uh, we are pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Uh, Robert Nimanoff, uh, Professor of Physics at Michigan Technical University. Hi, Robert. Hi. Uh, Dr. Nimanoff is well known in the scientific community for his work on microlensing and gamma ray burst. And uh, I'm particularly impressed. He's been the first author or co-authored 293 different publications. That's amazing. I attended one of his lectures at Fermilab a, a while back where he presented this superluminal effect that is a concept of spots of light from a laser moving faster than the speed of light, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But that's not what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, you probably know him as one of the founders of the Astronomy Picture of the Day website on, on uh, NASA. And the APOD is the thing I think we all admire and many of us look at every day. And that's what he's going to talk about tonight. So Robert, if you're ready, let me turn it over to you and uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank All you. Here. Let's see if I can start this up without getting electrocuted. Uh, let's see, share screen. One, share. Now let's go to slideshow. Play from current slide, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Now, okay. what we usually do is we, we mute our mic, so when you ask us a question, we have to fumble around and click on the mic and, and then answer your questions. Okay. So give us a couple can seconds. you see this cursor moving around? Yes, we can. Okay, good, because I'll use that. Okay, well, um, I am the first person here, Robert Nemroff, and uh, Jerry Benel was my uh, colleague, and we started the Astronomy Picture of the Day uh, website back in 1995. And so we're coming up on the 25th year anniversary. And uh, so, but what I'm gonna do today, tonight, is uh, give the year in review of 2019. So I realize it's 2020, but the year of 2020 is not over yet. Also, since 2020, since there's 10 years from 2010 to 2020, one could call that a decade. So at the end, I'll go over a few of the best or most memorable uh, images in the decade of astronomy imaging as appearing on the astronomy picture of the day. So my home university is Michigan Technological University in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And Jerry's home university is the University of Maryland in, you'll never guess, Maryland. And we both used to, well, Jerry still sits at NASA, but we both represent NASA and we're happy to speak here at the uh, Astro Imaging, um, not conference, um, channel, channel, thank you. Okay, so what is an APOD? Uh, some of you know. So if you know, just sort of look away. If you don't know, don't be embarrassed. You can find it by apod.nasa.gov. So we're served from NASA, and we've been doing that since 1995. And our, what we do is, is conceptually pretty simple. Every day we put up a different image, and then we explain it in a uh, paragraph that's hyperlinked elsewhere on the web. We try to explain it on a wide variety of um, of levels. Um, so uh, our hypertext is a uh, best link. We try to explain things that way. And we believe that we are an archive, we're an encyclopedic archive of uh, some of the really great astronomy images. So one of our main communities is the astronomy imaging community. And they send us some of the greatest images that, that we've had the privilege to present. 
And so our job isn't to take the images. Our job is to recognize really good images, recognize really uh, educational images, and try to describe them in an educational and an astronomical sense for a wider audience. But if you need an image, if you remember ever seeing a cool images, there's a good chance APOD's got it. So you can go to apod.nasa.gov, and then you click on obvious things to find our archive that goes way back to 1995. Okay, so I will review the 19 year of 19, of 19, boy, not of 2019, uh, by going back even before that uh, to 2018. So some of the best ones from the year before, we I just couldn't ignore, sorry. So this is uh, a, an animation, an illustration of something that was big news in astronomy, really big news. And there was an asteroid, Oumuamua, that came from outside of our solar system that we recognize. And there might be asteroids coming into our solar system all the time, but we didn't have the, uh, the ability to identify them. Oops, uh, sorry. I'm trying to get back there. We didn't have the ability to identify them until recently with computer searches finding them and being able to track them with enough images to determine their orbit. So this one was clearly um, coming in from outside the solar system, which means it has a hyperbolic orbit. So um, most planets have a near, and moons have nearly circular orbit, but they're really elliptical. Past that, there's um, um, parabolic orbits that are pretty much open. But if it's a hyperbolic orbit, then it's not open, that it goes, it comes in from somewhere in, outside the solar system and goes out somewhere else inside the solar system. So in this animation, and so up here at the top, we'll see the day it appeared. So if you ever want to know more about what I'm saying, you can go to the astronomy picture of the day for the number at the upper left. So it's in 2018, November 20, not hard to find. This tells you how long you have to, to watch, you know, if you want to watch all things, it's a 22 second video. I happen to tell you that in this presentation, but many times the APOD won't tell you that. This gives you credits because we just explain them. The credits are, you know, a lot of people went to a lot of trouble to make these. And so we're always careful about attributing what it is that we present. So this is a video. Uh, videos work well on presentations. Most APODs are static pictures. But here we see um, the inner planet zipping around. Uh, this is obviously not an image. Here comes the the asteroid, and it goes zipping out, but then it does something that's already known to be strange and went pretty near the Earth. But then it did something even stranger. It went on a trajectory that was unexpected. And the unexpected reason for the trajectory is probably because it's, it's not spherical and it's emitting more in one direction and that it's probably, there's gas outgassing and there might be effects of where it's reflecting because it's probably very um, flat but it was unexpected. And so the first thing that comes into our solar system is a very strange object. At the end of this, we'll show you the second thing that comes into our solar system that, we are, that we're aware of uh, is not really all that strange, but this first one is really strange. And some people have even speculated that it might've been some sort of artificial intelligence, but I do not believe that myself. I think it's intriguing speculation, but I don't think there's enough evidence to say anything close to that. Um, so. But it certainly leads to some great conversations about that. Okay, so here's another one that occurred in 2018. This is November 2018. This goes for a minute and 36 seconds, but it'll go faster you might, than you might guess. This is so, picture that you're on, oops, sorry. I don't know why it's jumping back here. Let's see if we can get back there. So picture you're on the International Space Station, as I'm sure many of you have been, and you're looking down at Earth. What happens? Well, you see all kinds of stuff go by, but every now and then, if you know exactly where to look, you can see a rocket launch that is, the rocket is then um, bound for the International Space Station. So here we go. Oops, again, there seems to be, so we can get this. Okay, this has audio, this has music. And if you look right here, you can see this uh, rocket launching to the space station. And I apologize again, I'm trying to, oh boy. as I fight with the technology. Okay, I'm not gonna move the cursor this time. So you will see the, um, the rocket launch toward the middle of the screen. And as it moves toward the upper right, you can see lots of city lights on the earth, around the earth. You can see the thin atmosphere of the earth and you can see the rocket that's coming to the space station with its exhausts. 
as rocket exhausts and there it's dropping a stage and creates a, a flash there in this time lapse. And now there is a uh, rocket that's, the lower stage is falling back. And I won't show you where it is, but you can see stars going by. You can see Orion going by now in the upper left. Here you can see the core stage re-entry. And then it's nighttime on Earth. And you can see the, uh, the core stage re-entering. You can see lights and clouds on Earth. You can see stars going by in the background. And this all takes place over an evening, well, several hours. It takes 90 minutes to do a loop around the Earth, so the darkness isn't going to last more than 45 minutes. So here you see a lot of city lights. And you still see on the upper right the um, spaceship coming toward. And this was brought to you by Astronaut Cast, ISSA, Italian Space and Astronautics Association. All right, I'm gonna try the cursor now. And if it takes us to the next thing, that'll be good. And it does, okay. So this past year, so we're now we're in December of 2018, if you look on the upper left. And so the past couple years have been really big in astronomy and astrophysics. That's a meowing cat you hear, it's my cat, Mima here, which I will pet, which you can't see. Um, sorry for the meowing. Uh, she's really a good cat, though. So anyway, the, the past couple of years, there's been spiraling black holes that have been creating gravitational radiation. And the first gravitational radiation was seen a couple years ago. It's like seeing the night sky in a completely different way. It's really an amazing sight to see. Uh, well, it's not sight to see. It's an amazing thing to detect. And so there's been increased um, interest in spiraling black holes, which is what's creating most of the radiation that we see, most of the gravitational radiation that we see. So Robert, here, nation of two we're black not, holes spiraling. We're not seeing any video or any... Oh, yeah, I haven't started yet. You're just seeing a black okay. hole. Sorry. So ready, set, go. So here you see in the middle, again, I'm reluctant to use my cursor because it's jumping around. You see two supermassive black holes, millions of solar masses going around and around. There is, I'm going to turn up the volume of the, oops. You should hear Hall of the Mountain King, Edvard Grieg. Can you hear it? Yes, we can hear it. Okay, good. It gets louder, so I'll turn it down. So uh, the region in the very center wasn't simulated. This is a computer simulation, so we can better understand what kind of ra real radiation would come out during these spiraling black holes? What we see with the gravitational radiation is the very end result. We see the two black holes merge into one, and the tremendous amount of gravitational radiation that comes out there is then seen by huge gravitational radiation detectors here on Earth. But one question is, what optical information would we see? Would we see it in gamma rays? Would we see it in optical light? So this just shows you what might happen with the blue light being emitted. And here we see actually two black holes going in front of each other in a very strange fashion because gravitational lensing is causing them to look unusual. But it's the same thing you're seeing before. You're seeing two black holes spiraling around each other, getting closer and closer as they emit gravitational radiation. <laughs> Brought to you by NASA Astrophysics. NASA got a space flight center. So I used to work at NASA Goddard with Jerry Bennell, who's, who's there now still. I ran away though. Okay. So, oops. So here is an image sent to us. A lot of the images are sent to us because people were in the right place at the right time and recognized it was something interesting. So we get about 10, we're up actually recently. We're rejecting about 20 images a day. But this one was just really interesting. So this is like uh, by Cal in Russia, it's by volume the largest freshwater lake. 
Uh, I live near Lake Superior, which is the largest freshwater lake by surface area. Uh, but uh, at the bottom of Lake Baikal, unusual things, and near Lake Baikal, unusual things are happening, including methane that comes up. And the methane comes up in columns, in bubbles. And usually you don't see a lot other than bubbles, but when it freezes over, like around this time of year, uh, the bubbles get frozen in and it looks surreal. And so here we have a story to tell because uh, methane and carbon dioxide are possibly related to, are, are related to global warming. Uh, we don't know if this coming out is related to humans creating global warming, but certainly methane and carbon dioxide have that effect and have that effect for millennia. So here you can see on the top, you can see what it's like to look across Lake Baikal. You can see mountains around the side and you can just look right down into the really clear ice that you could stand on and see the methane bubbles that are frozen in. And I just thought that was really cool. So we went with that one. Okay, uh, the end of in December 2018, it was a huge anniversary because Apollo 8, uh, 50 years earlier, went around the moon and saw something a little bit unusual, which they knew they would see, but they didn't expect the drama of it, the amazing part of it. And now you see what it was they saw. As my things get out of control, you wouldn't think I've done this before. Okay, ready? So you should hear this too. This is C Major Prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach. I happen to be the one who picked the past music for this, so you can blame me. If you notice in the center, there's something a little bit unusual coming up, or it's very usual. It's our Earth. So you can see the uh, magnificent desolation of the sort of brownish gray moon. But then over the limb of the moon, as Apollo 8 was circling the moon, comes up this blue marble. And when they saw this, they scrambled because they realized that this was tremendous. They had a Hasselblad camera, which they took a picture, they took color images. So this is somewhat digitally remastered from what it was. This actually recreates very clear, closely what they saw out the window, if you're looking out the correct window. I think Bill Anders is the one who had the best view. And uh, so they took this picture, and although there was some discrepancy as to how important it was to the mission to take the image at the time, it has become one of the iconic images of our, of our era. And uh, the image, a similar image to this, was shown, was selected by Time Magazine as the image of the century for last century. And this is what they saw. The first humans, because Apollo 8 was the first one to go around the moon with humans, they saw the, the Earth rising, the Earth rise. And you can see the moon go by as they circle the moon. And the Earth gets higher and higher in the sky. Okay, and then the image that was similar to the Time Magazine uh, image of the century would have been remastered now because they have cover images, they have the ability, because of astro imagers like yourself who are so good at this, who've blazed the trail, it's possible to recover with the known colors of other images, the high resolution images that were taken with Hasselblad cameras and do the best in both worlds. And by both worlds, I mean it in every way because both worlds also means the moon and the earth and come up with this really great image of what was seen by the Apollo 8 crew humans as they went over, or they went around the moon and saw the Earth rise. Okay, so we run a lot of images that are taken by different, um, some people think they were like the Hubble picture of the day, but we're not usually. Uh, Hubble is way, well less than half of our images, but we do a lot of Hubble images. This one was taken by Wise, uh, and this is, shows you the somewhat familiar Orion Nebula, but taken in infrared light in several bands of infrared light, where different bands are assigned different colors by astroimagers that aren't actually taking the images themselves. They're downloading NASA images, not from Hubble this time, but from WISE, and putting different colors for different bands. 
So this isn't just a complete fancy throw any colors on those. Each of these colors means something in the infrared and it shows a different infrared color. So it's scientifically interesting because if you look at the red in this image, it is some of the more red infrared and tells you where certain emission is coming from. Okay, so beginning of last year, we get, this is one that was again submitted to us a lot of interesting things happening on the same thing since Comet Vertanen, which is the green spot near the bottom. And then there's the familiar Pleiades that everybody has seen multiple times. And then there's the Hyades on the left. And then there is uh, meteors from a meteor shower. Um, and this is all taken toward uh, Taurus. And it was a, a Casado image uh, from Starry Earth, who is a noted astroimager. OK, something unusual happened. So we're now well into January, toward the end of January of 2019, as we review the best or some of the most memorable Im images of uh, 2019 in astronomy and astroimaging. So this was a total lunar eclipse, which are usually less spectacular than total solar eclipses. But due to advances in technology, lots of people look at the moon now during a lunar eclipse. And something becomes more visible, which is a when meteors hit the moon, there's little flashes. And now people across the globe, several people, are monitoring the moon, in particular during a lunar eclipse, you can see relatively dim flashes because the moon's kind of dim. Uh, and so many people noticed this, and this was actually a, um, uh, interesting scientifically because I actually had a graduate student, uh, Matapan, who looked at this, and the images that were sent into APOD were then used, because we got so many from around the globe, uh, to uh, not only pinpoint where the image was, but in but uh, tell things about where the impact was and how, how broad the impact was and uh, by the uh, parallax of the moon at the event, because everybody, the impact nailed the time down to within a fraction of a second. So all these images that were being sent to us that had the impact, they, we all knew that we didn't have to coordinate clocks. They were all taken at the same time. And that was useful scientifically. And so here you can see on the left, doesn't go uh, one of the images. And again, one of the major images shown here is from Peter Horlach, another very famous astroimager who submits the pod frequently. Okay, this is, this is a Hubble shot. So um, this was also combined with Subaru data. So we have astroimagers that are combining Hubble data with other major telescopes or their own telescopes. So this is the, um, this is the, um, uh, I think it's the coma cluster of galaxies, lots of galaxies in there. So this galaxy here is called D100. This is uh, D99. And you can see, if you do the astroimaging right, a long tail of gas that's stripped out of this galaxy. And so this is useful scientifically to figure out what's going on and how galaxies, what happens to galaxies as they move around and through clusters of galaxies. Okay, so 2019, 2019 was famous for what's now known as Arakoth, but through 2019 was mostly known as Ultima Thule uh, for the New Horizon spacecraft, which is uh, the fastest spacecraft that zipped out toward Pluto and went through around past Pluto in 2015, I believe. And so then it went off to a new, uh, they tried to find something uh, that was, uh, we tried, the community tried to find something and uh, this asteroid that was felt far out in past Pluto in the Kuiper Belt was chosen, and it was very interesting. It was two planetesimals that were sort of connected to each other. They probably spiraled around each other and hit. At first, we thought they were both kind of spherical, but then we know that particularly the lower one is more of a pancake, and the upper one is, is not. And there's, there's definite regions on here and relatively few craters. So seeing an asteroid that's out distant in the solar system was turned out to be well different from most asteroids we see in the nearby solar system. And that tells us about the formation of our own solar system. Okay, so this past year we had uh, Juno zipping around Jupiter in elliptical orbits. And so it kept re sending back images and um, Astroimagers, uh, including Gerald Eichstadt, uh, have been taking these images and 
piecing them together into videos. Not only they've been processing them into really good images, they've been creating videos out of them. And this is something that the Juno team actually doesn't have the ability to do itself, nor the expertise, because the astro imaging community of amateurs and even professionals has eclipsed the most of what NASA can do. Uh, you just your techniques are just better. Your community has come to consensus in better techniques. The software has become better, and so here we have uh, the um, the result of what it looks like to go near Jupiter from Juno. And ready, set, go. So this is. Uh, the planets by Holst. So there's maybe 20 images here. This is what it sees Juno going past Jupiter. And all the clouds, and belts, and zones, and colors. Here's the, uh, the dolphin image there. That's not real dolphin, obviously. It's just clouds that look like a dolphin. And now you can see part of the pole where it's much more strange and complex than had been known before. And we know that due to Juno. Juno is studying many things about Jupiter, including the magnetic field and the gravitational field to see how solid or liquid, Jupiter now appears to be mostly liquid as you go all the way in. And so that was one of uh, the 16th paths of Juno. And many of the passes have been set to music and just really give you an, I, an image of what it's like to be there at Jupiter. Oh, in 2019, we lost communication with the Opportunity rover, which had been rolling around Mars for a while. So it died in a well-placed, well-named valley called Perseverance Valley. And this is one of the last images taken by Opportunity. And you can look out and get a picture for what it's like to be on Mars. But uh, the curiosity is still rolling around Mars, and we're going to get another one later this year in 2020. But Opportunity and its, uh, and its sister rover, um, Spirit, rolled around for many years, many long, much longer than they were supposed to, and told us a lot about the ancient and wet history of Mars. OK, so this is a, an image, again, taken. Uh, well, it's not taken. It's a video put together to try to understand our universe. So this is um, called uh, the illustrious simulation uh, TNG, the next generation 50. And it came out in 2019. And it shows us what it's like to form a cluster of galaxies uh, from early on. And so uh, I chose the um, Beethoven's fifth, which seems like a little overkill. But actually, I think it fits pretty well, because there's a lot of violence going on here. So this is the early universe, the size of the of 100 kiloparsecs is shown on the upper left. The redshift, how far back in the universe, is shown on the upper right. And motion is shown in bright. So things that are moving fast are bright. And then we'll switch that over in a bit. You can see at the bottom, there's a lot of things coming together. A lot of mass. It's tracing motion of mass. And now at the top, you start to see another one. So there's different areas of matter falling together to form conglomerations and things zipping across the universe. So we're moving toward the modern times here with the redshift of one now. And now we're going to shift over. To instead of motion, we're going to look at brightness or brightness related to how much dark matter there is. And you can see there's actually two clumps to this cluster of galaxies, and they're coming together. So each spot you see is pretty much a galaxy. And the whole thing is going to form one cluster of galaxies, not unlike the coma cluster. And C is going towards zero, which is the modern time. And we froze it. So we compare these to what we see today and try to see if we can understand what's in the universe, which tells us that a lot of the universe is made up of things that we, forms of matter we don't know much about called dark energy and dark matter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to, uh, the models wouldn't, the simulations wouldn't match up with observations very well. 
So here's a picture of another cluster of galaxies, the Bell 370, and you can see the effect of this cluster on background galaxies because it strings them out into gravitational arcs. And so here you can see many of these unusual gravitational arcs. This is a star in the foreground down here. Okay, in 2019, in April, NASA dropped some gas canisters over Norway and had many ground stations record what they saw. And what they saw, people saw, as you can see, um, as sent in by Yang Sweet, uh, somebody looking at this unusual structure. So the idea is to figure out what the upper atmospheric winds are doing. And that helps us tell how, what aurora are doing. And you can see actually faint aurora at the top of the, uh, the image, but you can also see the, the gas canisters that were dropping and showing different kinds of tracers so we can figure out what's going on up there. Okay, well, so is a short, I, yes? I want to take a breath and see if we have any questions. Oh, from sure. Let's go we back. We have uh, about 50 people over on YouTube watching, so cool. I have I've only seen two questions come up. One was from uh, Jamie asking, do you still work for NASA or did they adopt your platform? Okay, today. So Jerry works at NASA. I work at Michigan Technology University, but I have a grant from NASA. And since we, since we, uh, um, we sort of, APOD is presented from NASA. So in a sense, it is presenting a point of view that NASA agrees with and uh, so in that sense, we sort of speak for NASA, but we're, but we're vetted. Uh, we're both astrophysicists, so we can speak from an astrophysics point of view. Um, so Jerry still works at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and we remain friends and in communication. Uh, I do talk frequently with people from NASA uh, many times about APOD. Uh, okay, good. That helps. Okay, and another question from Mike, more in relation to the asteroid Ultima Thumule. Are they Ooh, yeah. are they are they fused are they fused together or are they separate? Okay, good question. So we don't really know because we haven't landed there. It seems to us that their gravity would push them together so they would be pretty much fused together. Whether if a human landed on that, a human could push them apart or not, not sure. That's, so there's lots we don't know. Okay, and I've got no more questions here. Okay. All right. Why don't you continue, Robert? Okay, I will continue. So let's say you were on Mars and you wanted to see an eclipse. Uh, you don't have Earth's moon to do it, but you have the same sun, but you do have two other moons. So Phobos will occasionally cross the sun and it looks pretty different from our eclipse. Here's what it looks like. Cool. That was so good, we're gonna run that again. Ready, set, go. So we live in a, on a planet where the moon has roughly the same angular size as the sun, but uh, on Mars, that's not true. So here we see Phobos is much smaller, but still, if you know when to look, you can see it go by. So one of the most popular images of the past several years, scientific images of astrophysics, came out in April of 2019, and it was the first horizon scale image of a black hole taken by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. So here you see it in front of you, probably everybody has seen this before. So the dark spot you see is probably not just the event horizon of a black hole, it probably incorporates gas and the spin of the black hole, so it's not so simple. Uh, it's unclear what you're, how much of what you're seeing is gravitationally lensed because the black hole is also a strong gravitational lens, of mass gas around it. So its spin will cause distortions, its gravity will cause distortions, but we've never been able to see down to the, event, the angular size of the event horizon before. So here we did for a nearby galaxy, and currently they're putting together an image of the center of our own galaxy, which will have a relatively similar uh, galactic scale. So this tells us about the center of our galaxy and about how supermassive black holes on the scale of millions and billions of uh, solar masses, how, how they work and what it really looks like to get down to that scale. Okay, another mystery that deepened in 2019 was the Mars methane mystery. So there have been reports of methane on Mars. And so there, had been, there was continued reports even last year, but then at the same time, some satellites were reporting there was 
methane, there were other satellites that, were, that arrived at Mars that were saying they don't see it. So now we're wondering whether Mars was there before and it dissipated, whether it's a, it's a daily phenomena that it comes and goes. People are wondering what destroys methane on Mars, what the abundance levels are, but it is certainly a mystery that many planetary scientists are trying to figure out. Who cares if there's methane on Mars? Well, methane could be a biomarker. A biomarker would indicate that there's some kind of life. So one possibility, which is less remote than, um, than the one with the, um, the Oumuamua being from uh, outside the solar system is that there's some kind of microbes under Mars that are emitting methane. Now we're not, we haven't detected that. We're not saying it's there. We're saying it's an interesting possibility and we're keeping tabs on the methane of Mars and how much is there and how much it changes because it's a possibility. Okay, so here's one of the coolest images. So this was uh, reprocessed. I think it has some, uh, some X-ray images from, X-ray data from Chandra. So it was processed by Rudy Poe, an astroimager, and it takes the Hubble image of the wide field cat's eye nebula, which is a planetary nebula, which is sort of what will happen to the sun as it ages and ends its life um, and creates a, black, a white dwarf in the center. And then its atmosphere gets blasted atmosphere gets blasted out and creates something unusual. This is like art. So we didn't know that stars created art after they die, or maybe their art's only better appreciated after they die. Uh, but here, the purple is uh, also the x-ray. So this tells us uh, a lot about what's happening. Uh, whether this is due to the binary nature of this star or the spin of the star isn't well known. So we're listening to Mars. We're not just sniffing Mars for methane. We're listening to Mars to find out what's in the center of Mars. This happened during 2019. Maybe the center of Mars is pretty much liquid. Maybe it's not. So the way we find out is we put a uh, seismometer on there. So um, SICE is a seismometer, and this is listening on Mars from NASA InSight. And we don't know how many Mars quakes there are or how deep they are, so we're discovering that too. We're also discovering that even wind that blows past some of the, and even when you move some parts of the NASA InSight, you can hear that in a very sensitive seismometer. It has detected Mars quakes, but hasn't yet gotten enough data to really tell all the way what's really happening in the inside of Mars. Like we can tell like the inside of the Earth because there's earthquakes that are pretty deep in Earth and are on the other side of the Earth, so we can see that. Uh, so we're, we're investigating the inside of Mars with this little device here, just this past year, learning more and more. Okay, astrotourism is becoming a bigger, bigger thing, as you might know. So one place you can go is you can go to the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent in Mexico, and this image was taken of that pyramid uh, with the Milky Way in the background. We're getting a lot of good astro images of famous UNESCO, United Nations uh, sanctioned uh, uh, landmarks with a night sky in the background. A lot of astro imagers are realizing that if you put something really cool in front of the, the cool night sky, that you're getting sort of the best of both worlds. You're getting the best of the night sky and the best of the Earth. So this is that case. So the time to do your astrotourism though is right near an equinox because then the sun that looks, that sh casts shadows from the side of the pyramid toward the center of the pyramid makes the shadows look like there's a feathered serpent moving from the top of the pyramid to the bottom. And it has to be sunny on those days near the equinox or you don't see it. And now there are crowds uh, that, that do see this. Okay. So we've been discovering lots of exoplanets, planets away from our sun and uh, our solar system. So we went over 40,000 in the middle of 2019. And uh, Matt Russo and colleague uh, who do a lot of uh, sonic, they sonify a lot of images, which is like another dimension. Yes, you can take your astro images and take them so you put something cool in the foreground, but he takes astro images and he sonifies them. And so here we're gonna hear what it's like to, for the discovery and what's known about, some of what's known about 4,000 exoplanets. 
So I'm starting the video off in 1991 with the first exoplanet. The exoplanet count is now at two in 1994, three. And each time there's an exoplanet, the color tells you, based on what it says on the left, what the detection technique was. And the pitch tells you the higher the pitch, the faster the planet goes around its, its star. And where it appears, you can see the band of the Milky Way drooping around here, the deep of the Milky Way. And you can see more and more of these, and as it gets closer and closer, there's more and more exoplanets being discovered. So Kepler is coming up, and you see a lot of Kepler in the transits on the upper left. And then we went over 4,000. And so there's, there's new satellites that are, that are going up to uh, see more and more exoplanets. OK, so uh, solar imagers, a brand of astro imaging, uh, were treated or untreated, depending on how you look at it, because the sun for much of 2019 had very few and sometimes no sunspots. But another thing that some astroimagers like to do is they like to time their, with, if you have the right app and you're in the right place, you can time it so the space station it can be seen in front of the sun. So here we see on the upper left, that's no sunspot. That is a space station, the International Space Station, moving across the sun. And there are no other sunspots, other sunspots at all. And so this was uh, taken by Rene Carcuccio and, uh, these things are, are usually pretty popular on APOD, and uh, so it's, it's really cool. It's just another another part of astroimaging that, that we run. Okay, 50th anniversary of launching to the moon came up in 2019, and here we go. So here we see there's no sound, so I will provide your sound. This is a, um, Apollo 11, so it's a Saturn V rocket, and here are some astronauts who you might have heard of, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Um, yeah, I can't remember his first name. You don't remember his first name, call it out. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed. So they're going to go up and uh, so where are we going? Is this trip a long trip? Oh, yeah. So they're going to get on top of that big rocket, one of the biggest rockets ever. They're going to do what's called light that candle. And there's a Saturn V as it goes, taking humans to the moon in July, 1969. So this is a conglomeration of several images, several videos. And you can see the slow motion of the Saturn V blasting off. Hadn't been done before. Now, humans have been around the moon on Apollo 8, but have never gone to the moon with the purpose of landing on it. So a lot of people on Cape Canaveral watching it go. And here's a reaction shot from the crowd with their cameras. There's uh, Lyndon Johnson and Spiro T. Agnew standing next to each other. They're from different political parties, if you didn't know. Not sure what they said to each other. But they're all part of Team America, which is going to the moon. OK, so later, a few days later, not trying to, there was a descent to the moon. So there are, right now it's dark, I understand. So I'm going to show this video here. And I'm going to skip ahead to 1426. So this is going to be the, uh, okay, not working here. This is a landing sequence that was put together, he says, trying to get it to go. Okay, he's trying to skip toward 1426 when we go to for landing. So what you see in the middle is what the astronauts see. 
Everything else is put together later by W. I David Woods from the UK. This is another kind of astro imaging, just putting stuff together that weren't all available at the same Level time. One. So we can see it historically. Same time, we're going, Okay, we're going. We're going, same time, we're going. So you see images from mission control on the left. Transcribes of Aldrin and um, Armstrong are saying on the left, lower left. The tilt of the lunar lander is toward the right. The height of the lunar lander is on the right. The computer mode is P64, which tells you that the computer is running the, the landing. What you see out of one of the, one of the windows, there's two windows, is in the center. So they've practiced this a lot. All you have to do is put it down on the moon. At this point, Armstrong entered P66 mode, which means that Armstrong has overrode the computer and saying, oh, no, you don't. I'm going to land this thing. He says that because he can see the boulders on the surface. And he doesn't know. And he also sees there's slopes on the surface, though, with where they're headed. He doesn't know if the computer can handle that. He wants to land on a flat surface with relatively few boulders. So he's going to guide, glide across the lunar surface and look for a place to land. And he's controlling it. You hear Aldrin is saying most of the words, but Aldrin knows that Armstrong is, is, is running the show here, is landing the, the lunar module. And Aldrin's helping him by calling out numbers. So this became unexpectedly dramatic. So there are warning lights that are going on. They've got to land this thing. The 210 feet off the surface. There's a crater under them they can't land on because it's too sloped. It has to be, the lunar lander has to be relatively flat if it's going to take off and meet it back up with the uh, with the spacecraft that's circling my comments. So now there's something called a bingo call, which means that they might have to stop this and go back. When bingo call gets to zero, they can't land anymore and be safe. They didn't think they'd be this close. Bingo calls getting to within a minute. Armstrong's looking for a place to land. Aldrin's calling off numbers. There's a minute to bingo call. 60 seconds. Mission Control says, look, 60 seconds. Do you get it? 60 seconds. Down two and a half. There's drama here. Forward. Forward. That's 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. 30 feet off the surface. 35 seconds to go forward. Four forward, drift into the right level. Aldrin's calling out numbers. 30 seconds. 30 seconds forward. Mission Control is concerned. 20 seconds to bingo call. I'm back right. Okay. They can't stop. see the landed side. Oh, People on Earth are listening. They can hear all We've had shut down. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, Here comes Armstrong. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And humans were on the moon. And this is the panorama they could see outside their space. Apollo 11. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. 50 years ago. After our moment, they Goes for a while. Roger, Eagle, and you are safe. Roger, Eagle, okay. So there are other things that happened in 2019. So here is an image of where we are in the universe. So we're in the Milky Way, and there's there's lots of um, things around. There's um, great attractor, lots of galaxies. So this is a very long scale here. This is put together by a famous astrophysicist, uh, Tully, our Brent Tully. And so we can see here that um, there's a great attractor of mass here, but there's also a local void that's kind of repelling us. So this is where we're moving. We're moving with respect to the local universe, and we don't always know why. 
we took a step forward in our understanding with the local void and knowing where the Perseus, uh, Perseus Pisces supercluster was and exactly we sort of know where it was, Coma cluster, Great Attractor, Hercules. So this is like the contours of mass in the local universe, better known in 2019. So we passed Pluto several years before with the New Horizons spacecraft, uh, but Pluto is actually several different colors. And to create a really good true color image of Pluto actually took a lot, somewhat of processing. So uh, Alex Parker from SWRI uh, put together over years of data, coming over data, what Pluto would look like sort of to the human eye to New Horizons as it passed by. So here's a um, Sputnik Planum, and there's you know different dark brown areas and light brown areas and slightly different areas uh, on on Pluto. So a few years later, we find out a little better what it would look like. Okay, in 2019, uh, it was reported that there was water vapor discovered on a distant exoplanet. So one of the goals of modern astronomy is to sort of make sure humans are safe because we're looking for things in the solar system and we're finding things coming from outside the solar system. We're also looking for other life in the universe. How unique is Earth? How unique is life? So besides the Mars methane mystery, we've discovered that as we expect, there probably is, there's water vapor and probably water on distant planets, uh, planets orbiting other stars. So here we see the water vapor around a distant exoplanet. And this is an illustration, this is not a photograph. Okay, so in the Earth's atmosphere, there's also interesting things going on. This is a sprite, it's a kind of lightning, and it was taken in very high definition. Uh, so you can really see a lot of the, the, the details, which are not all well understood. And this was taken by Stephane Vetter, another noted astroimager. Okay, so we're coming on a new period here. Many astroimagers are aware that when you take a long-term image of something, you're going to get airplane streaks and satellite streaks and bad pixels and cosmic rays. And so the image that appears on astronomy picture of the day, say, is not the real images that appear. So this is uh, a conglomeration of images before it's been processed. And it was not processed with Photoshop. So it was processed by Kiers Shearer, but I called it Photoshop because people know Photoshop and it's become a colloquial phrase, has it been Photoshopped? So this is the Andromeda Galaxy and their airplane, you know, this, these are airplane things here and there's all kinds of satellite images and there's uh, cosmic ray things and it's cleaned up here. And here's what it looks like, although in color, uh, when it appears on uh, some place like astronomy picture today, you don't see any or many of that. They're, they're minimized. Here it is before and here it is after. And now with uh, many more um, Earth orbiting spacecraft, like this coming SpaceX uh, constellations and other communication satellite constellations, uh, it's going, there's going to be even a greater need for reducing satellite trails if you're going to get deep imaging. And so the astroimaging community will be on the forefront of that. And a lot of the images that we show, people will never know that this whole constellation of satellites uh, communication satellites went, went in front of it. And here's the second interstellar. So in 2019, uh, the second um, um, asteroid, it was actually a comet that came from outside the solar system, uh, Borisov came through. And this looked like pretty much a regular comet, but it was on a hyperbolic trajectory. So we know it did not or originate in um, probably not in the Oort cloud or in the Kuiper belt or is not periodic, it's from out there. And that's exciting because we can't, it's hard to go out there to other, other places in the galaxy, but if we wait long enough, maybe it'll come to us and we can start to be able to identify it, things that are coming to us uh, with all the, the rapid imaging and computer technology. So this is a Hubble image. Okay, so in orbit, this was the first all-female spacewalk occurred in 2019. And uh, so here you see two astronauts replacing uh, some equipment that had was failing. And so they were out there for many hours and, uh, and uh, Christina Koch and Weir, I think, were out there. I don't have my notes with me, so I can't tell you exactly who it was. 
So that was in 2019. So here, toward the end of the year in December 2019, the Mercury crossed the sun. Uh, so here you can see a little dot. Let's turn that down. So the little dot is Mercury. So many people went out and saw this. This is a, a time to go out. And over the few hours that, that Mercury crossed the sun, this is actually not taken from the Earth. This is taken from the Solar Dynamic Observatory. And it was put together by NASA's uh, really cool and great science visualization group. Okay, so people are wondering what was the most popular images on APOD. So uh, it's easiest to judge the most popular image as it appears on our Facebook. So APOD has um, mirror sites in many languages, 20 different languages. So if you have a favorite language that is not English, there's a good chance that APOD is translated daily into that language. But also, if you don't like getting your images on the web, you can get it from Facebook or Instagram or another place or an app. So Facebook in particular has lots of statistics that it tells us. So uh, we find the Facebook audience is typically in the 20s and the early 30s. The Instagram audience is younger. And their audience looking at NASA images right on the NASA website is actually mostly older, sometimes in their 50s or so. But anyway, according to Facebook, along the 20 and 30 year olds, this was the most popular image of 2019. It was a dragon aurora over Iceland. So uh, there's an interesting story behind this. This is the astrophotographer's mother. So the astrophotographer was Jinji Zhang uh, and Wang Zhang, or Wang Zhang. And uh, so they were uh, in Iceland uh, doing, again, some astrotourism, looking for aurora, sort of aurora tourism. And they noticed that this aurora was looking more and more like a dragon. And so when they told their mom, she ran out and took a look. And so they took a picture of a human reacting, sort of like, oh my God. And so one of the more popular types of images on APOD is when you have an aurora that looks like something, or if you have something that looks like something else. Um, so nebula will look like something, because then it looks both real, it looks familiar because you can say, oh, a dragon's somewhat familiar, although we don't have them, although Game of Thrones had a lot of them that were fictitious. So, you know, dragon, the icon of a dragon is familiar, but auroras are a little bit not familiar. So it's a mix, and you can see the background star field. It's an interesting mix of the familiar and the unfamiliar. You see familiar snow, you know, you see a familiar person, but you see an unfamiliar shape in an aurora that looks detailed and pretty cool. So this is one of our more popular images. So now we're gonna go to the best images of the decade, then I'll open it up for questions. So, this was one of the most popular images. This come, came from Hubble, and it was processed by uh, Domingo Pestiana, uh, an astro imager. And so he took a Hubble image and he brought out the colors. So here you can see this is a ring galaxy, but it's got an older part in the center. So it's a really complex ring spiral, spiral ring galaxy. And there's a lot of science that can go on with this. And so there's a lot of interactions between what the astro images are doing, even by manipulating Hubble images, and what scientists, and that brings out science for scientists sometimes. And so here's a video by Daniel Lopez, another prolific astroimager. So he timed this really right, really well. So this is the moon setting behind a, uh, a lip of a crater. And the, the music was by a friend, not a famous composer, but maybe one day will be famous, but wasn't famous at the time it ran. And so many of them are actually looking toward us because the sun is setting. This is a near full moon. So when the moon is full, it's opposite the sun. So many of them are looking toward us from the edge of this volcano. But this is real time. What I love about this is you can see the people walking around in real time. So they're walking around at a pace you would expect. And yet the moon in the background is setting. So you get this when you have, you're just looking at it from many kilometers away. So we're running short on time, so I'm gonna skip a bit toward the end. You can see the whole thing by the APOD. Actually, this is a 2018 image video. Okay, 
And so this is a very popular image. So someone just happened to catch an aurora that was happened to be shaped like a foreground tree. And it's just kind of cool. Obviously, the tree has nothing to do with a background aurora. But it looks like, wow, isn't that an interesting coincidence? So it ca causes people to stop and think and look twice. One of the more popular images of the decade, and probably the most popular image of the decade is sometimes we run atmospheric phenomena. So this is a water spout that's connecting sideways. And I had to ask for permission for this because the person didn't know about astronomy picture of the day. And um, Jolie Mo Mole gave us permission. So we ran it and it was tremendously popular. And it is really cool. Is it astronomy? Well, we show weather on Mars and we show weather on other places. So it's weather on Earth. And so there's a lot of powerful things that go on in the atmosphere that can affect. We've shown um, videos of hurricanes. So this is a, a video or videos, a still picture of a water spout off the coast of Florida. Okay, with that, I'll say uh, I'll take questions. So you can follow the Astro Imaging channel by one way is going to their Facebook page by Facebook at the Astro Imaging channel. And we're proud to be celebrating our 25th anniversary coming up in June 2020. So with that, I'll return it and open it up to questions. I'm going to close this presentation so you'll see my face pretty soon if I can do this right. Okay, Robert, just, just two questions came up. Uh, one okay. from Mike asking, which galaxy was shown with a black hole image? Which galaxy was shown with a black hole image? I'm trying to think, was there a black hole? The, the one that they it was a composite of many shots and they showed the uh look, look like a Taurus. Okay, that was um that was the center of a M87, I believe. Okay, center thank you. M87 is a, has a quasar with a long jet, but also has a supermassive black hole in the center. And so, with uh, radio telescopes uh, across the earth, they were able to map that in sufficient detail to see horizon sized features. In the center. Okay. Which is know, the okay. We've got one from yeah. Mim. Is asking, um, will Robert talk about Starlink? Starlink. Okay. Starlink is uh, no. Robert's not going to say much about Starlink. Sorry. Starlink is the SpaceX. I'm not affiliated with SpaceX. I do know that they plan because they made it public knowledge. They're going to launch thousands of satellites uh, in the next few years, which will be great for communications, less good for astronomy. But they're working with astronomers, and astronomers are having meetings to try to figure out the best way to do science in the era of multiple communication satellites. We've got another from John uh, asking, how do you get an APOD? How do you get one? How do you get one on your desk? You go to apod.nasa.gov. How do you get your image on APOD? The same way you, you go to um, what to the what's the name of the place? Um, practice, practice, practice. Um, either you're in the right place at the right time, or you have a lot of experience because you watch the astro imaging channel, and so you learned a lot about how to do things. And then you took a really good image that might have had a lot of educational value, or it might just have lots of layers. It might tell a really good story. It might be the best image of its type, and we haven't run an image like that recently. But remember, we're rejecting 20 images a day, and many of the images we're rejecting are from themselves well-known, well-accomplished astroimagers. So it's a pretty competitive market out there. But you should enjoy, you shouldn't do astro imaging because you might get an image on the astronomy picture of the day. You should do astro imaging because it is fun and you create great images that you're proud of yourself and you can share with your family and friends and other astro imagers. And if it just so happens that we select your image, that's great too. That's Robert, great. Yeah. when they you think they're going to be able to get a higher resolution uh, image of Sagittarius A star? And certainly a lot closer than a galaxy. Yes. It, yes, good question. The Event Horizon Telescope people are doing that. Have, they've got a lot of data in the can, which means they've got a lot of observations on the ground already, to my understanding, and they are processing them and they're taking more. And that will give us uh, a detailed image of the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, which is about 4 million solar masses, which is surrounded by a region called Sagittarius A star. And sometimes the black hole itself is called Sagittarius A star. And it is probably a very interesting black hole, 
and we're going to find out how interesting probably in the next few months. Terry, any more questions? Nope, that looks about, that's it. No other questions. Well, I, have, I have a lots question. Of yous, lots of thank yous, that's about it. I have a question for Robert. Okay. Um, uh, you've been doing this for 25 years, so that's a, you know, that's a long time. So my question is, have you noticed a, um, a particular spots in on, in time where images got significantly better? It, 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 from from a technology like a, maybe like a when going from a film to CCD was that a jump uh, like uh, a narrow band uh, filters yeah. and things uh, like that you know why the images get better and better and better back in ninety five there was one astro imager who was really better than the rest his name is David Mailer and what happened was he was just producing the greatest stuff. And we ran a bunch of his, his, his images. We ran some other images, but he was really the best. But because, but the world caught up to him. So he was able to use the astro, the, the a telescope in Australia and tremendous techniques. And some dark, my understanding is darkroom techniques uh, that were really innovative. But digital imaging and the fact that people can now take with their own telescopes and NASA is making available telescopes and major telescopes are making their image, their data available. So the world caught up to him and they were able to do with Photoshop type stuff, stuff that he was doing in his dark room and stuff he was able to do digitally earlier on. So he is really a pioneer, but since the world has caught up to him, now there's like a hundred David Mayrocks and all of, the, all of many of which are probably on the Astro Imaging Channel producing tremendous things and holding conferences like the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference and the Western Astro Imaging Conference and conferences in Europe and teaching people how to do this. So there, the information as to how to create great astro images is getting out there. Now the cost of the actual telescopes, the, the, the mirrors themselves are a little bit went down. The, um, the cost of the, um, the CCDs, uh, the, it's gone way down. So many more people now have the ability to take images, wide images that would, didn't exist before. So there are wide images of the Orion Nebula that didn't exist before and that are 200 hours of imaging. And so we're seeing things thanks to amateur imagers that we've never seen before. We didn't know they were there because big telescopes like Hubble see only a tiny little small part of the sky, a little small part of the sky. but Astro imagers can take their, their telescopes and see big parts of the sky. And they can look at them night after night after night and make the images better and better and better and take out the bad frames and clean out the satellite trails. And so astro imagers are really on their own frontier and they're teaching professional astronomers about how to do this. So this is a real frontier here. And so the frontier has moved beyond a single person and it's just every year just getting better and better. And so we didn't, of course, and we don't have a, we didn't know this was gonna happen, but we're certainly riding the wave. So part of the reason why APOD is still as popular as it is, and we're as popular as we've ever been, is because of the great images and the great capabilities of astroimagers like you, like you, like this community. So thank you. Didn't you tell me in your presentation at Fermilab that the APOD site is the most traffic site that NASA has? Uh, well, it depends on the time of day. So, um, so the NASA.gov domain itself is usually the most popular domain, but inside of that, many times, apod.nasa.gov is the most popular one. Not always, but many times. That's great. Well, if we don't have any questions, all I can say is thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, you That's have great. a crowd over on, on YouTube and uh, lots of discussions there. and. Uh, you may have inspired a few more astrophotographers to submit more image, so maybe you'll get another 10 or so a day. To that would be great. Through. Thanks again to everybody. Thanks for having okay. me. Okay, uh, I just wanna make one more reminder that uh, anyone that, that knows someone or would like to give a presentation on the Astro Imaging Channel, just send us a note uh, from our website, the Astro Imaging Channel, and uh, we'll be glad to fit you in. Uh, most any topics with regard to astrophotography are fair game, 
and we can always use new and, and different kind of presenters. So if that's all, Tolga, uh, can you take us out? And I'll say goodnight to everyone. Thanks for watching. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.